We have to give people some sense of hope that if they stay, help is on the way. I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, and this episode of Right Angle is brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. And gentlemen, that quote comes from Vice President Kamala Harris. We have to give people some sense of hope that if they stay, help is on the way. And what she's talking about is a, uh, a, a program, plan, scheme, strategy that she's been tr- entrusted with uh, by President Biden to develop a way to reduce the uh, catastrophic flow of immigrants to the U.S.-Mexico border. And the way she is going to try to address this is by bringing in the Commerce Department, the State Department, the Agricultural Department, the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development, and other agencies to deal with the source of the problem, not at the border, but rather upstream in what they call the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, which is where apparently the the majority of those people crossing the U.S.-Mexican border are actually coming from. And she's starting, she says, with several premises. um, And one of them is that people don't really want to leave their home country. Uh, Given the choice, they'd rather stay where they grew up or near where they grew up. They'd rather see their grandma on a regular basis. They'd rather uh, enjoy the same culture that they're accustomed to and speak the language that that is common to where they grew up. Um, So if they want to leave and go somewhere else, it's because things have become untenable or insufferable where they are. And there's a place where they think they can improve their lives in this case and in the case throughout our history, it's been the United States of America. They're planning on spending uh, hundreds of millions and perhaps billions of dollars to address this. And Stephen Green, all of that I actually thought was a, a rather good approach to saying, hey, let's not wait until they get to our border. Let's find out why they're leaving in the first place and see if we can deal with the problems at the source. Until I read a column by Colbert King in the Washington Post that said the, uh, that he was supportive of what Vice President Harris is doing. And when she brings all those people together in a room, those cabinet and agency heads, the first question she should ask, Steve, is what happened to all of our money? And then he goes through and chronicles all the money we've spent in the past decade or so, less than a decade, really billions of dollars, on efforts at economic development and agricultural technology improvement and justice reform and nutrition programs and and all of these other things that were designed to make Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador places that aren't so horrible that you want to get out of them. Uh, Steve, we've been doing the same thing over and over for years and hoping to get different results. And part of that would want you to, you know, inspire you to write satire or some withering column uh, as you do. But really, what else can you do? That is the question. You know, the the world has never had a shortage of uh, old countries, if I can borrow former President Trump's memorable phrase. That's why there's an America. That's why there is an America, people who looked around them and said, this sucks, but it's too broken for me to fix it because, you know, I'm 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 a serf. I'm tied to the land or uh, the German immigrants who came over here to escape the the Prussian draft and all the rest. Um, This has been the place to come to. Uh, I'm a big supporter of legal immigration. I love legal immigration. But um, I learned is in, in my 20s, uh, I had to let go of my sort of teen and early 20 libertarian idealism for uh, for open borders, because the more I read about two things, uh, uh, infectious disease and terrorism, the more I realized that even a country like America has to be able to control its borders and it has to do so in a sensible way. This idea that President Biden had, uh, I'm sorry, Presidentish Biden had of uh, practically inviting uh, people to to swarm the border. Well, it's exactly we, we knew it was going to happen. We saw Barack Obama do the exact same thing. You know, we the the premise of this is that the problem isn't the border. The problem is is over there. You know, in those countries. Well, the thing is, from 2017 through t- 2020. The problem was at the border and the problem was largely solved at the border by doing the sensible thing that any country does. One of its primary jobs is to maintain an actual border. 
Scott, we've we've proven that you can't fix countries by sending them money. Um, you can't you can't fix uh, broken communities in this country by sending them money. If uh, if throwing money at problems solved problems, we would have run out of problems to throw money at a long time ago. Uh, this is one of those issues where there might not be a good solution. There's no perfect solution. There's no if we tinker with this, if we send that, that we can make Guatemala just you know so nice it could be our 51st state. Um, maybe there are things we can do at the margins, but at heart, the best thing we can do, the only thing we can do is to go back to being the kind of America that we were premised on being, protecting rights and protecting liberty. And if we can do those two things, I think the rest will eventually, at least here, take care of themselves. Bill Whittle, I think I agree with Steve to a certain extent that we dealt with the issue at the border a couple of years ago, but I don't think we really solved the problem because it didn't stop people from wanting to come here, or from trying to find clever ways to do it. It may have temporarily stanched the flow or reversed it in some cases as we send people back. In fact, the deporter in chief title goes to uh, Barack Obama. Um, so, you know, presidents have been trying to deal with this issue in a long time. And I got to be honest with you, Bill, if I lived in California and they said it was illegal for me to leave California and go to Texas, I would do it anyway. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I'm, so I can. That's the that's the trigger I'm waiting for. Is when they tell me I can't leave. That's the second that's I'm going right. to execute. Yeah, because I would rather be in Texas than California, and so I, I can understand uh, that. And and I don't, uh, you know, I don't want to go to the traditional Republican way. Oh, that Kamala Harris, she won't even go to the border and see the problem there. She's a boy. I think that Vice President Harris is taking an approach that is a at least legitimately reasonable approach to how one might get at this problem. The only challenge is that it's been tried before in a variety of different ways with a great deal of money and, and still uh, has failed. Um, it's one thing if there's a problem in Pakistan there's not a land bridge from Pakistan into California or Texas. And so we don't, it's not as big of a threat to us. But Bill, what do you do when you've got these folks who are, you know, who are closer to me than you are to me right now, geographically, mm -hmm. and who are living in these terrible places with terrible justice systems and gangs and poverty and something like 60% hunger in some of these countries. Um, how can we possibly address them as Americans uh, without just saying, hey, let's be a fortress? Uh, first of all, I just want to make sure I got that right. Did, uh, Camilla Harris said, if you're here to stay, help is on the way. No, 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 no. She they, she meant stay in your home country. Let me let me get oh, that quote thank correct. Because I thought, my God, no better oh. way to stop the yeah, flood we of have refugees to give people... by telling them just hang on long enough. More money's coming if you can only get it. No, here. no. We have to give people some sense of hope that if they stay, okay, meaning stay in Guatemala, El Salvador, or Honduras, okay, that help is good. on the way. Okay. So basically what we have here is we have a, a thermodynamics problem. Uh, it's not even an economics problem or a political problem. It's a thermodynamics problem. Things move from hot places to cold places. And the greater the difference between heat and cold, the, the more energetic that flow will be. If two things, if you allow that to go on, if you have something hot and something cold, and give it some time, that old devil entropy is going to make sure that eventually they're both going to be exactly the same temperature. There'll be no motion between the two of them anymore. So we have a, we have a thermodynamics problem. We've got, we've got, Places where the, the, the pressure to leave, where the temperature is very, very high, and it wants to go to where the temperature is low, and that means coming up here to North America. So that's how you have to look at the situation. In order to stop this dynamic, the, the thermodynamic solution is to get both of these things to more or less the same temperature. The greater the difference between the temperature between the two, the more people are going to try to move from one to the other. Now, you can ruin both countries and make life in America as bad as it is in, in the, the slums of Guatemala that they're trying to escape. Because if America becomes identical to the slums of Guatemala, we won't have an immigration problem anymore, right? There will no longer be that, 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 that difference. There will no longer be that, that uh, incline. But obviously, I would rather do this the other way. I would rather raise the, I would rather raise the standard of living in these other countries to reduce that difference in temperature, and that'll slow down the flow. So how do you actually do that? Well, we know how not to do that. We've seen uh, in the 70s and 80s, especially in Africa, 
what happens when the federal government throws enormous sacks of cash to these socialist dictators. And what you end up with is, and this is not an exaggeration, you end up with a with an enormous international airport in the middle of a jungle with a four-lane highway that extends four miles out into the bush and then stops. That's what you get. And it's named after the guy who was the dictator who took the money in the first place. That's not going to do it. There, in my opinion, there is only one way to solve this problem, and I think it is absolutely surefire, and that is microloans. Um, direct loans directly to the individuals, their governments never touch it, and those loans are specifically to start businesses, and under no other circumstances can they be, can they be issued. Microloans in, in Africa, I think the return rate, and, and sometimes to start a business, they need like $300, you know, they need like a couple of sewing machines or something. And, and so you, you get a lot of bang for the buck. The return rate in terms of if you can send us $300, we'll build, we'll get these sewing machines, we can sell dresses. Something like 96% of the total $300 that gets sent and it gets, it gets paid back, my God, it's the antithesis of what we're doing. And it works because it's grassroots. It works from the ground up. And, and so that's basically it. The problem is, in a nutshell, over there is a system that doesn't work. Over here is a system that does work. If we send money from the system that does work to the system that doesn't work, then all we're doing is provide more incentive for people to come to the system that does work. What we have to export is not cash. We have to export the system. We have to export capitalism. We have to export private property, individual rights, a legal system that protects your property rights, protects your person, all of that. That's the only way to reduce this gradient and it's an enormous problem. But I have been in, I have been encouraged by microloans by in a way that I think nothing else in the world encourages me. If you go directly to the people who are making a personal appeal for their private business, that amount of money is a is a, a infinitesimal fraction of what we would send to the government, does so much more good, employs people, plus you get your money back. Who could argue with that? Uh, last weekend, my wife and I were driving around just looking at houses and enjoying the beauty of Texas. And we live in a little neighborhood that's relatively modest homes, uh, but well kept. And they're, you know, lawns are usually mowed and um, there's, you know, no Chevys up on blocks in front of the house. And things, things are relatively decent here, although not fancy. I, we drove across the lake and took a right and just said, hey, let's just follow this road and see where it goes. And next thing you know, we're in like a third world country. I had no idea. And it was a sprawling, vast area. Uh, it was a slum. I mean, it was like every once in a while, there was like a decent house that somebody had built like right in the middle of this slum. But it was like dirt roads with deep ruts through them and junk cars everywhere and you know dogs running the streets and 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 it was overwhelming as i thought how could this be just across and the lake is not that big it's like a half a mile to the other side of the lake i'm like how is it possible that right across the lake from where we live in relative luxury um i'm looking at this place that looks like it's in guatemala or honduras or El Salvador, and the worst parts of some of those places, and and I was thinking, well, what can be done here? How you know, if we built decent low-income housing here, would this improve the standard of living, or would the average person who lives there say, I got three dogs, I can't live in a two-bedroom apartment of decent you know housing, and I like to work on my truck, and you know, and I you know I want to keep the chickens, and so you know you you can't just go in and take people's lives and turn them over and say I've got a government plan for you that's going to involve low-income housing. You're going to have a much nicer place. It's going to be clean. It's going to be neat, and uh, you just have to get rid of the dogs, the chickens, the junk cars, and you know we're going to pave the roads by the way. And oh no, if you do that, then people will come back here. We'd rather not have people come back here. And so what I what I was thinking through in that process was how difficult it is to change an entire culture. You can't just come in and impose an external stamp on it and say, well, let's do things our way. So I'm totally on board with, with uh, Bill's idea of saying what we really need to do is we need to export the idea. We need to export the system uh, of capitalism. But that there's got to be an element of want to in all of that 
that I don't know how you export. Because the people who are here in the United States early on were the people who decided that they couldn't fix the whole countries that they came from. And so in their case, it was, you know, Great Britain was their personal one, or, or it was the Netherlands, or it was Germany, or it was whatever. But they left the places that they found intolerable for a variety of reasons and came here at great risk to their personal lives in order to set up a system where they could basically be left alone. And then they got to craft their own government. But we're way down the timeline from that now. So how do you do something like that with Guatemala, short of having a people's revolution that somehow miraculously is not a communist revolution. And I gotta be honest with you, I'm turning to the people in the comments section to answer the question. <laughs> Cause I don't know how, you know, we're so close to Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, not to mention parts of Mexico, some of which are lovely and well-run and some of which are horrible. Uh, we are so close to them. We can't just say, well, we're just going to, you know, let's just pretend none of that exists. That's not going to affect us. It is going to affect us for a long time into the future. So we have to figure out some way of dealing with it. What do you do? And I'm asking you, my friend, yes, you, the guy watching this right now, the woman watching this right now, I want you to start, that's right, shaking your fist at the computer monitor. I want you to to propose seriously now, not sarcastically, not nasty, not, and I don't want to hear any, your, any anybody who's got any racist crap to spew, go to some other video, okay? Um, but what would be a way to do what Vice President Harris is trying to do, which is solve the problem there so people don't have to come here? For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott, eagerly waiting to read these comments. Thanks for watching.